It's been fine. All right. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, first things first, what brings you to Latvia? Um, part of a summer of travel. Just pure travel, vacation? Yep. Yep. Pretty much. So what, what are your travels then? Uh, so started, I was living in Hungary up until April. Um, and from there went to Vienna, Romania, Ukraine, over to Jordan, uh, to Copenhagen, uh, Lithuania, and now here. That's pretty, that's a pretty, pretty big, uh, uh, yeah, territory you covered there. Yeah, yeah, it's been a good summer. So, so what are your impressions then compared to the, the previous countries you visited? Yeah, you know, I, I, especially after you're traveling through Europe for a long period of time, the, the fear of mine is that things start to become redundant. And, um, you know, nothing against uh, Vilnius, but when I was there, I thought this is nice, but I could tell I've been traveling for a long time. It wasn't really getting me excited. Right. And I got here and I felt very differently. The Art Nouveau buildings throughout the whole city, the squares, um, all the restaurants and cafes. It's a very beautiful and, and kind of unique city from what I've seen before. So I've really enjoyed it. Is it really? It is, yeah. So you were in Vienna, right? Yep, yep. It feels like Vienna in a way, right? Which, so yeah, I mean, you can always categorize things in similar ways, but the fact that I'm comparing it to Vienna is a really good thing and it's, it's kind of a, a pleasant surprise to me. Did I, do I remember correctly that somebody told me that Hungary has nice architecture but really uh let down places in the sense that they have the architecture but they mm -hmm. didn't may do the maintenance mm. i don't i'm not sure well so, do so I remember correctly the, the thing for me with budapest is it's this very, very nice city center and there's a few really major very important and very nice sites the castle and the cathedrals and things like that um but the average building is you know, nice, but nothing special. Whereas right. in some ways, the average buildings here seem to be really phenomenal. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Just walking around town, I'm looking around and taking pictures of random buildings, which I very rarely do when I So travel. you are one of those? I guess. I'm one of the people that's probably getting into the Because, yeah, I was, I was always sidewalk. wondering, just somebody standing and just <laughs> look, taking a picture. Because yeah. my father is a real estate evaluator, right? Okay. I, I've been photographing buildings, I don't know how, for many years, right? Uh -huh. So I always thought, is it a real estate evaluator or just uh, a weird tourist? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, probably a lot of weird tourists out there. <laughs> so what would you do with the, with a picture of a building? Tell me. Um, you know, it's, it's just something to kind of help remember my trip. You know, like I, I will post some photos on Facebook. But ah, most of you my posted. Photos, yeah, but not yeah. necessarily those. You know, my, my photos will just pick a handful and post them up there. But come um, on, you won't, you won't put those pictures in a photo album, right? No, no, or probably not. Memories of Riga. Yeah. And then just, yeah, exactly. just build it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that when I get to it, you know, 10 years from now, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's what made Riga so unique. But you probably just take a lot of selfies as well, right? No selfies. What? <laughs> what? What kind of person are you? No selfie stick? No nothing? Uh, I don't think I've taken a single selfie on this, on this trip. Maybe, maybe 10 with me in it. Oh, so you most of the time just ask random people to photograph Well, you? so I'm, I'm traveling solo now, but I've went, been with um, two friends throughout this trip and my mom on this trip mm -hmm. at different times. So they'll take photos of me and stuff like that. Sure, sure. So how come you are traveling that much? What, what brought you to that kind of lifestyle? Um, I've always loved traveling. My mom was a Spanish and French teacher. So I guess from a young age, I was kind of interested in the world. Uh, Spanish so and French yeah that's yeah. a rare combination isn't it yeah um a little unusual she learned at Spanish, least in america decided right? she wanted to learn france and yeah nice. learned French and went with it is she american she is yeah hmm. yeah wow yeah and now she's a teacher um now she's mostly retired and she does interpreting so she works with uh like for example she work with a school child who just moved to the u.s from latin america and help translate for that child's parents when they're having meetings with teachers, things like that. Well, what's your what's your background in a sense? Where where did your ancestors come from? Um, Do you know? I don't know for a fact. I know that uh, my last name is Bussen, and and that's just maybe Germanic, or I've heard Dutch as well. I was with a was, double S. Uh, double S, yeah. Bussen. Yeah, it's, we pronounce it Bussen. I imagine sounds like ger a Germanic Bussen. type of yeah. yeah. Probably some Anglo mixed in with all that as well. So, how far how far do you know your ancestors? 
not very far, a couple generations, which is mid-America, as far back as I know. Hmm. So would you say that your whole uh, family is more or less uh, interested in, in world geography, travel, languages? No, no, I, I would say that... Um, You're an I, outlier. I, I'm an outlier, yeah. Really? Yeah. Most so, of my family's in St. Louis, and that's where they plan to stay. St. Louis? Yep. That's, uh, that's the city? That's right? the city, yep. State of Missouri, and maybe four hours south of Chicago. Was it the car. one with the arc? That's exactly right. Yep. All right, yep. all right. Because I think, because I think Nelly, the rapper, yeah, from that's there, right. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, lives. I think still lives uh, not too far from where I grew up. Where, where is it? is it? Like on the map? Would it mean more to the? It's uh, like west? central east. Central east. Yeah. So no connection to the ocean or anything. No, twelve mm. hours, maybe maybe eleven hours to the nearest ocean, which is mm -hmm. Florida, northern Florida. What's the situation over there? I mean, I always imagine that. American states are more or less autonomous countries in many respects, right? Since it's a United States. Yeah, yeah, federal state. So would you say? Would you say you you feel like a, um, what would be the proper name for for a person from your state? A Missourian. Missourian. Yeah. Sounds kind of weird. <laughs> yes, it does. So would you would you say you are a Missourian? Um, you know, I, so I met this really interesting guy when I was in Jordan a few weeks ago, and we asked him where he was from. In Jordan? Yeah, no. yeah. I had 10 days there. Isn't it uh, a bit unsafe? Um, you know, not not so much, I think. He's just kind of using common sense in places that you go. All right. Um, but anyway, he, he was a very well-traveled guy, and I asked him where he was from, and he said, I'm from everywhere and nowhere. And I kind of feel like that. You know, I, I'm a Missourian, but, uh, and that's where home will always be. But I like the world. I feel like people are people everywhere. So do you really? Yeah. Yeah. But you probably could have seen many, many different cultural differences, right? Weird yeah. ones, yeah. nice ones. Yeah. I mean, people are people, which is, you know, for both good and bad, I guess. Right. Sort of depends on the situation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I guess the, the circumstances do make a difference. Yeah. But, you know, at, at, at the core, the, the core characteristics of people are, are pretty consistent from what I've seen. People want to be um, helpful. They want to be friendly. And really? It, in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't think of very hmm. many really. I can't think of very many travel experiences that were bad because people were being unfriendly or unwelcoming to me. And I've traveled through quite a few different. You've been to France, right? Yeah, I love the French people. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine that the the biggest difference would be where where religion is quite a major impact. Yeah, you know, I, I've traveled through um, a lot of the Middle East, and I found them to be the most welcoming people anywhere I've gone. Um, hmm. Because you're not a woman, right? I'm not a woman and I'm white. I mean, that, that probably helps. You're, you won the lottery over there. Yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, hospitality is built into the culture. And, I guess so. And, you know, so, so to me, it's, it's always uh, more nuanced than, than I think at first impression, which is why I enjoy traveling so much. Do you enjoy traveling since you are a little child? Were you, were you a little child? Um, yeah, yeah. I guess my first trip abroad was I was 11 years old or something like that. And uh, I absolutely loved that and couldn't wait to study abroad when I was 18 and hmm. love that. And, you know, as much as I can ever since then. And so, I, I guess at this point, kind of in, in building my career and my life around having ability to travel at different times. So what is your career? Um, teaching and soon to be a student again, going back to school in August. What? Yeah, I'm going to be so a really more... old student. <laughs> um, so I've been teaching in uh, Kyrgyzstan and Central Asia for the last... Kyrgyzstan. I'm trying to imagine where... Is it next to Kazakhstan? It is, yeah. It's south cool. of Kazakhstan, west of China. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, yeah. all those different Uzbekistan, towns. Pakistan, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so beautiful, beautiful region. Damn, how how did you find that place? Um, so the the short version of the story is um, went to law school, was a lawyer for a year and a half, two years, and in America. In America, yeah, didn't like it, didn't expect to like it, but figured I should try it before saying no to it. Um, got involved with my alma mater, uh, doing some teaching there. Love that. Um, decided I needed to do it full time. Joined the U.S. Peace Corps, which is a U.S. government program in Kyrgyzstan. Um, taught with them at various universities around the region. What is the Peace Corps? 
Uh, so it was started by John F. Kennedy, and it's a typically 27-month program where um, Americans of any age, though typically young, uh, go to one of 100-plus countries around the world and uh, essentially volunteer, work for a very small stipend uh, in the local communities. Is so, it, but it's not a charity, right? Um, it's not a charity in the sense that it's it's government run uh, as opposed to a, a nonprofit, for example. But that ba that basically is it. It's doing it's doing charitable type work. So, what would do we have some Peace Corps people in Latvia? No, um, ah. the Peace Corps focuses on developing countries. You know what? I would say that Latvia is still a developing country. <laughs> You know, maybe in maybe in some of the village areas. I haven't been there, but uh, yeah. Well, I've heard I've heard of the Peace Corps, right? But yeah, I, yeah. I don't have any association. What would they do? Because they are not definitely not the Red Cross. Right. They're right. nothing of that sort. But yeah, it's it's interesting. Do other countries have similar uh, type of organizations? Yeah, yeah. There are some that are similar. Um, I guess I'm a little bit biased in favor of the U.S.'s because I think it's one of the most. Um, it goes deeper than most. It has real local integration, and you are um, the biggest badasses. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think Sweden has a big program. Uh, Japan, they call it JICA. They have a big program. Where um, Japanese people go abroad. Yep, exactly. Really? Yeah, there, theirs is one of the ones that is um, about as deep as the hmm. U.S. is. So you go into these very small villages in Kyrgyzstan and there's American volunteers wow. and there's Japanese volunteers. Wow. So so the point being, you as an American go to Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there's, sort of, there's, two, there's two components of it. The first, and I think the reason it keeps getting funded by Congress every year, if I'm to be a bit cynical, is sort of the diplomatic component. You're going into communities with people that have maybe probably never met an American. They only know it from reputation, which is cool. not always great. Um, Wait a second. You, Kyrgyzstan has probably a McDonald's, right? It does not have a McDonald's. Oh, no. then you need to bring the civilization as soon as possible, <laughs> they man. Ju they just got a KFC. They're on the right track. Those pity, pity people. Right? Yeah, you yeah. can pity those. All right. So, yeah, then it's for sure. So that's the criteria then. You just choose those few countries in the world where they don't have an MC, <laughs> right? And then, 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 then the red. peace goal yeah. goes in. Yeah, yeah. Nice <laughs> strategy. That nice probably would be a good shortcut for nice it. Nice strategy. All right. Yeah. Well, then I would definitely be all in for for the peace Corps. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in McDonald's to people around the world. It's a good thing. Bring the civilization. Bring the. <laughs> That's right. I mean, honestly, because I remember I, I saw a Vice piece on. Um, I think it was uh, Kuwait and all those, all mm -hmm. those uh, neighboring countries where they had i guess more fast food joints than per capita than the us okay yeah right and then then they sort of have become in the last few years the most obese right nations right. <laughs> I, I'm, i'll be honest i don't i don't consider that uh, fast food uh, fast food uh, joints make you fat it's just that yeah you might as well you can you can get uh, excess calories in the grocery store right right yeah. it's just that it's just that that people might as well be i don't know not too lazy i wouldn't say but still i mean you just choose where you eat what you eat how you eat yeah. and, and so forth right so i would guess those people who get fat in a fast food yeah. restaurant yeah. would still get fat just by eating yeah if they didn't have the fast food yeah in a grocery store yeah, that's probably i would true. imagine so yeah at, at least but yeah i mean the, the fast food restaurants i mean i don't know how it's now but i would imagine that a bit still but when i was growing up it was a big event to go actually to the uh, right fast right. food restaurant right yeah exactly and I, and I think that's still the case in a lot of places i remember driving past the mcdonald's at like 11 p.m when i was in morocco and it was out the door line everyone was excited to get in yeah and actually if you go to the old town yeah let's say uh thursday friday night it's a place to be. You'll see. You'll see the big, big line for young in people, front of right? the is McDonald's. It, is yeah, it a young people hangout spot. Not necessarily. I mean, all right? those people who just want to eat some tasty food. Okay. Because it's all around tasty, right? There's nothing. It is tasty. Nasty, yeah, it's nasty, tasty, tasty in a way that like it's gonna kill you over time, but it's it's tasty. So, do you consider yourself like a, like a healthy food advocate in the sense that oh, no sodas, no. <laughs> No hamburgers. Um, yeah, I guess so. 
So, but it's not like a moral thing. It's just a personal choice, you know. It's not like if someone's drinking a soda next to me, I'm going to judge them for that. It started with the Super Size Me movie, didn't it? I think so. Yeah, that that brought a lot of negative attention to it. Yeah, and, and all those court claims and their everything. Yeah, else. and there was just something recently on like the way they make their French fries and the potatoes that are being bought and those being sprayed with with herbicides and so so forth. Well, that would be a poison. Yeah, that would be definitely something to avoid. Yeah, I would think so. But in a way. Still, I mean, if you take a good potato, put yeah. it in good oil, yeah, but put some good salt on it, yeah, there's nothing bad about it. It's so irresistible. It does, doesn't seem, that. yeah, yeah. Okay, I've have you heard of the what's it called, the Icelandic burger? I haven't. Oh, I, th- I think it was called either Icelandic burger or Icelandic cheeseburger. The point like being, a whale burger. Hmm? Is it a whale burger? No, no, no. It it was um, after two thousand eight or nine. I don't know why, but Iceland, somehow McDonald's decided to go away from Iceland. Okay. Right. So, so one dude apparently bought the last uh, cheeseburger or, or one of the last cheeseburgers and he put it on a, like an, on an exhibition. Okay. Right. And now it's, it's, I think it's in a hotel lobby okay. being streamed 24 seven. You have a webcam on it. <laughs> And the point being that it's it's what almost ten years now, yeah. And it all sort it's of looks fine. looks the same, <laughs> yeah. right? Looks nice. Yeah. I think it was streamed really on on a webcam twenty four seven. Huh. Yeah. I'm sure McDonald's loves that image. Yeah, I was still I would still eat it. I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's just yeah. It it really. What do you think about personal responsibility? How do you mean? Well, when it comes to at least food yeah. or the choices you make. Right. Right. In a way, society would be. Um, obligated to educate you, right? Right. But once you have the education, once you have the information, yeah, wouldn't it be up to you to make the decision for yourself. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm all for uh, independence and being able to make your own choices. Because that's the American way, isn't it? That is, yeah. As long as you're not hurting someone else with it, right? So yeah. now you can get more complicated. You can say, well, what if you have universal health care and you're eating a burger a day and you weigh? what would it be 150 kilos or something and now we're gonna have to pay for you to have your quadruple bypass surgery right it gets a little more complicated at that point i chatted yesterday with a canadian Mm -hmm. well he said yeah in a way the healthcare system works fine but you would still find some long lines at uh, at the hospital or whatever doesn't seem doesn't sound too bad right yeah because i think even the americans sometimes envy the canadian healthcare system i do yeah really yeah so you've been not based ca- on personal experience, just from the the numbers, right? I think Canada is probably doing a better job of um, reaching reaching everyone. Maybe it's. Have you ever thought that Canadians are not really necessarily better at things? They are just so few, and they don't have that um, different or mixed mentality towards things. Because America is really a hodgepodge of different right, nations, right. ethnicities, right? Yeah, Canada. Yeah. Just pr- yeah, probably descends from French and British. Yeah. That's about yeah. it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it bears a lot of similarities to the Scandinavian countries, which do so well in our very Seems like it. Yeah, yeah, seems like it. But then again, you would have the argument about, oh, it's because the, all the people who live in colder climates mm-hmm. need to be smarter and more sophisticated. Yeah. Well, so yeah, you're getting into complex issues at uh, why people are the way they are, why civilizations develop in the way they develop. I actually recently read, uh, I finished reading um, one book uh, written by Hans Eisenk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and basically, I guess he, he's considered one of the biggest psychologists in, in the 20, 20th century, I guess. Okay. And yeah, he was, he was but the, the book was from the 80s, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, and he was complaining about how people don't really acknowledge the um, empirical data mm-hmm. when, they, when they do those i don't know what what to call them ethnicity studies or just random people studies but when they just divide between let's say asian ethnicity caucasian Mm -hmm. and blacks right that they consistently have similar results right Mm -hmm. and and the basic structure would be that asians always get the top Mm -hmm. numbers and the blacks get the the lower numbers yeah so the the magnitude might not be so big but still you can find the upper echelon asians lower echelon blacks right Mm -hmm. and he was complaining about it well it's not really related to anything politically correct or incorrect it's just look 
here's some data. These are the stats, yeah. Yeah, yeah, use it. Yeah, <laughs> right? and we, we've seen this in the U.S. with, um, I think it was Harvard, but I might be wrong on that, with uh, Asian, I think Asian American students that were suing them for um, sort of reverse discrimination, saying we've got too many high qualified, highly qualified Asian students applying for us. We're not going to let all of you in, even if we would let in a Caucasian or an African American with similar scores. Um, it's sort of like a quota system, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because isn't, isn't affirmative action directly the same? Uh, well, it's the reverse of that, right? It, one is the, the claim of the Asian Americans is that um, you're harming us, whereas affirmative action is um, not necessarily harming any group, but is helping a different group. So wouldn't you be able to actually help the Asians with some kind of uh, incentives? Maybe maybe they can get all all those competent ones, but maybe they have uh, one year less or something like that. Say, say that again? Well, well, they want to apply to, to study at Harvard, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And you see, oh, so many competent Asians, we cannot yeah. let all of them in. Yeah. Maybe you can let all of them in. But then you make a stipulation that uh, since they are so competent mm -hmm. and so many, mm -hmm. you just make uh, their studies one year shorter. Yeah. Right. Well, Maybe. in a sense, it yeah. would be beneficial or, to or them. Honors programs or something for for more qualified people. Yeah, because I mean, they're not. It wouldn't be. It would be definitely silly to say there's too many smart people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Of course. Nobody. Of course. Nobody would argue uh, for that. Right. <laughs> too exactly. many smart people. Yeah. So how come that America seems the one place in the world that's really so bothered by uh, ethnicities, uh, political correctness, and all those relate all those things related to some form of visual or feeling uh, that's that's quite oversensitive, it seems almost. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's it's oversensitive because the issues are real, um, and I also wouldn't say the U.S. is the only one. Right, we're seeing this with. Um, far right parties uh, across Europe. We're seeing it with the Shia versus Sunnis in the Middle East. Uh, we see it with uh, Buddhists versus um, Muslims in Myanmar. We see it with tribal warfare across Africa. I mean, there, there's very few parts of the world that I think are excluded from this. And the few that maybe are, are those that developed in a very homogeneous way, like Canada and Scandinavia, and in their modern days have diversified. Uh, I think countries like the U.S. that have always had this deep diversification have more difficulty in in dealing with it. And the history of the U.S. is is messy and complex, and there's a lot of disagreement about what that history actually is. So I think as long as as long as you're sorting out those differences, and as long as you have these vast economic uh, and to a lesser degree cultural differences between uh, races within the U.S., we're going to continue to have problems. So what will be the solution in the long term? Um, I don't know. Vote Great. for Trump 2020? I, I hope not. No, <laughs> I think I think Trump is the, the opposite of that. Right. I think I really bothered by him. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Trump is um, what, what I mean, what I hope will be the answer. I don't know if it is the answer, but what I, what I hope will be the answer will be greater integration and greater mutual understanding, mutual cooperation, mutual respect. Um, and I think Trump stands for the opposite of that. So Trump stands for the idea of representing a small class of elites, uh, which I, I was just really? I was just reading today. There's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt that says, "The clearest way across history that a state will inevitably fail is when the government uh, begins to represent a small class of the elites rather than all of the people." That's not the exact quote, but that's the essence of what he says. But wouldn't you be able happening. wouldn't you be able to say that about all the previous presidents as well? Um, I think that all presidents in the U.S. are, by definition, divisive. By definition, because we have political parties. If you're not a Democrat, you're not a Republican, you're not going to like the opposite one. But you will be always Wall Street. You'll be always, always, always supporting Wall Street? Yeah, probably in, in the, uh, the last couple decades. Um, but I don't think we've had past presidents that have um, attempted to define themselves by their divisiveness in the way Trump does. Trump actively speaks to a small class of Americans in a way that um, Obama and Bush, on opposite sides of the political spectrum, um, didn't do that. They actively tried to bring people together even if they weren't successful in doing that. And I think it was their failures, despite those efforts, that led to having Trump today. So would you say that Trump being in office is just a reaction to the failures of the previous presidents in b really consolidating the communities? I wouldn't put all the blame on the president. I wouldn't necessarily say... Um, all, the, all the administration. 
Yeah, in, in, in Congress, um, the entire governmental apparatus, um, where we've been in, in virtual deadlock for you know a decade or so, um, we've seen a lot of a lot of issues coming out of American society with globalization, um, with the rise of technologies and automation that's putting middle class out of work, um, with African Americans being left behind, but also white Americans in more rural parts of the country being left behind. I think there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fear of the future. And I think there's a component that is grasping on to Trump in the hope that he's the savior. And I think there's also a very sizable minority that's saying, I, I don't know, maybe he's crazy, but we've got to try something. We've got to try to switch it up because what we've been doing isn't working. He's definitely entertaining. I'll give you that. He is. Yeah. yeah. That's part of what works for me. He gets the airtime. That's all. That dominates the news. And it's interesting. It's honestly interesting because you really don't know what will come next. No, no. Right? So would you say that there is a chance that one of his, I don't know, uh, either commitments to do something or just random actions would actually be, uh, well, either so beneficial or so detrimental that, yeah, there will be some major shift? Because it seems to me nowadays... It's just that the concentrate the the time for attention for people usually is so small. Right. 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 It's it, just a hyper hyper information space. Right. This is one of the theories on why 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 he doesn't get into more trouble for things that would have ended other politicians' careers. Right. He's the Teflon president, but it's partially because there's so many scandals that by the time you finish um, focusing on one, he's moved on to the next, and you start to forget about the old stuff. Pretty um, cool. I mean, you you got to hand it to them. To, to hand it to him. He, Pretty he, cool. He is an expert at that particular area. I wish he was an expert at uh, the art of governance and policy, but he, he is an expert at the distraction. Um, but I do think there are some things that would stick with him. Um, I think maybe there's the catastrophic that would stick with him, and I hope some of those things are avoided. Um, I think maybe uh, uh, less painful way for him to fall would be if the Mueller investigation, which is underway, reveals that um, there has been wrongdoing within, within his administration. If that uh, happens, if there's something that... Uh, what what is the investigation you are speaking so, of? So the investigation originated with uh, claims that he and his, he or his administration had colluded with Russia. Oh, it was already mentioned before he even got elected, right? Right, exactly. And um, it seems to be picking up steam. A number of members of his administration have been brought up on criminal charges. Um, we don't know for sure, but it looks like it's coming to a conclusion in the relatively near future. And um, if the results are criminal charges are being filed, Trump is being indicted, something along those lines, and I think that will be hard for him to rebound against. Um, if, conversely, that's dismissed, then I think the American people are going to say, okay, he's not guilty of that, and forget many of the other scandals that have tainted him regardless of the outcome of that investigation. I thought Bill Maher recently uh, on the show Real Time mm -hmm. uh, talked about that it's probably impossible to actually get him out of office because nobody, because even if there would be some charges, somebody would have to agree on something and nobody will agree on that. And, and it means basically yeah. he's untouchable. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which would I be another great point for him. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if, if he, he may he may bring us to a constitutional crisis where things have to go to the Supreme Court to be decided. Oh, um, right, right. And if he, even if the if the court decides, what if he doesn't really do it or doesn't really follow the court decision or something? like Yeah, that? yeah. Then then you're in an even deeper crisis. I mean, I, I think if you're starting to, to go down those avenues, though, he's already destroyed. Um, he's not going to recover politically. Unless we're I, unless I, we're officially saying no, thank you to democracy, which is I think one thing the American people agree on is that's deeply embedded in who we are as a people, and, and that's not going anywhere. Um, he's going to lose his popular support. He's going to therefore lose congressional support. Um, he'd be out at one point or another if we went down that avenue. Yeah, I'm actually I'm going to be honest. From the outside looking uh, at that, mm -hmm. I'm kind of rooting for him. Why is that? I mean, it's so different because I, I remember I talked to um, either an American or a British dude. But still, we, we talked about uh, the differences b between governments and uh, leadership and politics. And, uh, and I basically told them, 
you have to remember most of the world only knows not necessarily just brute force mm -hmm. but still quite simple minded action and reaction and consequences right and the model that's that's america it's so advanced that i would say at least two-thirds of the world doesn't understand meaning you could take a person from a different region put him into america but not having all those values those morals those those, those upbringing circumstances with him he would act totally differently react totally differently and wouldn't actually be the person you uh would like a person to aspire to be mm -hmm. right so having such a character makes him more i would say equalizing with most of the world because in a sense uh, that type of uh strong man character even though he's not really presenting any strong man behavior right he's just speaking his mind not not caring about feelings many times mm -hmm. right that is more um, understandable i would say to two-thirds of the world because their governments their cultures their upbringings are more related to these type of of one man uh, big decision type of yeah. uh, of situations so <clears throat> i would say for in the short term he might be quite valuable as as an equalizer for american interests to be advanced in in the world just mm -hmm. because the language the type of language he speaks e either verbally or, or non-verbally yeah. is almost always everywhere the type of language the other people speak right yeah. so so that his i would say simple attitude many times would be actually more understandable to many many people around the world yeah and if he brings with him the american interests yeah it seems to me that the american interests would get much smoother uh, traction I, all, I think all, that's, all over the world. that's the, the the first issue right is if he advances the american interest in doing that right so it's it's arguable whether the strong man um is in the interest of the american people but with Trump, even if that, that is who he is, as a strong man, he's not advancing the American interest, he's advancing his own interest, in my opinion, right? So I think that's the first issue. Um, but I would say, secondly, I, I would disagree that the strong man model is necessary. Um, you know, I, I, it's definitely not necessary. Here's, mm -hmm. here's the point, right? America, overall, mm -hmm. is totally in, in the 21st century, mm -hmm. right? You have infrastructure, yeah, you might argue that some places have infrastructure that's quite old mm -hmm. and maybe even com the communications networks are old many times, but still overall, America, most advanced, most most badass country in the world right now, mm -hmm. right? You go to other places and you've been to many of them, you see, oh, but that's not the case all, everywhere in the world, right? Yeah. Many places, people still live like their ancestors, two or three generations ago right and so that type of culture doesn't really understand um you know those those type of em em empathetic or empathic empathetic empathetic yeah. attitudes right policies I, I think that there's there's lots of people out but there, there should that, be that, that anyway. don't but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy many of the reasons <laughs> people around the world and many people in the u.s don't believe that you can have an empathetic leader is because it's so hypocritical so often, right? We, we say we're going into Iraq to save the Iraqi people, and then, what was it, a million Iraqis die, right? We, we've got a history of overthrowing dictators and at the same time doing really great things and doing lots of humanitarian things as well, right? So my argument would be go the opposite direction. Don't say, okay, you think we're gonna be self-serving, therefore we're going to be self-serving. It would be, okay, we're wealthy, we're powerful, we have the luxury to be a little bit less self-serving, to be a little bit more idealistic. And yeah, it'll take some time and we won't always get credit for it, but after enough time has passed and people have seen that we're consistently abiding by our word, then that'll start to catch on. And then the bigger step is what follows, which is they say, hey, if the U.S. is doing that, why isn't my government doing that? They should start doing that too. No, no. Well, once, once you are at the place you are now in America, you actually have the privilege of saying, you know what, I'll start getting more self-serving. 
It's just that, all right, every, the spotlight is on us. Mm-hmm. America is in everybody's spotlight. Right. You can say, all right, I'll be diplomatic about it. Right? Mm-hmm. I'll get you a deal that it's not that bad to you. It's definitely beneficial to me. It's not yeah. that bad to you. Right. What would you want? Just we, we talk, yeah. we decide, and we do. Or I come, right. I take my hammer, knob you over, over the head, right. and take what I want. I mean, historically, you're correct, right? This is, this is what the Roman Empire did. This is what more recently the British Empire did. And they all collapsed. And they all collapsed pretty precipitously after reaching their golden age, which arguably the U.S. was at 10 or 20 years ago. So I think for the U.S. Do you really think that the golden age has passed? Maybe. I think it hasn't passed if we take a model different than what you're proposing, a model that hasn't worked historically, because eventually that model fails. You get beaten down on enough places, you overextend yourself because you have enough enemies. The best way to have a long lasting influence is to have goodwill around the world. And the best way to do that is to actually see the world as a more cohesive whole. And that's the, that's the part where KFC and McDonald's come in. Maybe. Yeah. It's, expe- it's extending no, some sort of American culture. You, you know what the fun- it has to go both ways too, right? It has to be us ex- accepting other cultures. You know what the funny thing is? As far as I remember, a Vietnamese woman told me, yeah, yeah, we had the war with with um, America. <clears throat> but somehow we're still like blue jeans, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's not that the, that the values America represents are hated all over the world. Maybe sometimes uh, the way the American values are presented are hated, but still, it seems to me that's the most efficient way to actually advance any interests. I mean, I think most governments in the world are just envy, envious of the American uh, yeah, force, power, and, and efficiency. Even though it's not super, super efficient, it's still the most efficient way of doing business all over the world as it seems to me maybe but i I think that there there's a question that is has not yet been answered which is whether the growth of the last 60 years seen around the world which is unprecedented in world history whether that is a result of democracy or capitalism or the combination of the two no definitely not because of communism right Capitalism. Yeah, yeah. Right? De- but definitely, but definitely not right. because <laughs> De- of we communism. Can, we can, that's we, for right. sure. We can exclude that, right? Yeah. We have China that, and Singapore that are throwing this wrench into the model that have capitalism with uh, dictatorship and they're growing qu- quite well. Um, whether that's sustainable is another question that I'm a bit more skeptical about. Um, but what we have seen in Western Europe, what we've seen in America, what we're increasingly seeing in Latin America, um, and even in other parts of East and South, Southeast Asia, is that where democracy takes, takes hold, economics tends to take root. And that's the value system of the United States that you're talking about. And mm-hmm. I think everyone stands behind that. Chinese people would probably tell you that they stand behind the root values that we're talking about, which is freedom, independence to make your own decisions and, and live your own life. It's just that the, that all comes with a contingency. Which is? And the contingency is we will, we will actually use our infrastructure, communication to influence your governments and to influence our economic uh, interests in your territory. Right. And this good, is this good. Is, yeah, right. Well, that's right, where I disagree. This, this is the contradiction. We'll, that we'll let we'll in let the we'll let, we'll let the secret agencies can <laughs> do all the rest of the of the deals. Yeah. I mean, I, what we're seeing not only do we have this economics versus governance contradiction question, but we also have this realism versus idealism mix, right? Which in America? Right. Yeah, in the, in America and in the world, right? So oh, I don't know. So any government that takes power, with a few exceptions, is going to be a realist, right? They're going to say, "This is my job. I want to get as much done for my people as I can possibly do." And then it's the people in that country that determine how realist you can be if you're a democracy, right? So if you're a democracy and you're saying, "I want you to go and help the Somali people." get past this famine they have right now, not because it's in our national interest, but because I don't want to see 7 million people starve, then the politicians are going to do that even though they know, they know it's not in their realist political interests, because now it's in their interests in order to get reelected. Right? Right. This is the power that democracies have, which is the people of democracies can demand of their countries greater idealism and less realism, which I would also argue across time over the last 50 or 60 years, we've seen America become slightly less realist and slightly more idealist, even if where that falls exactly is still indeterminate. 
but most of the time people are worried about themselves right <clears throat> in a sense that well what will it do for me because it's america right <laughs> right maybe maybe that's i mean there's certainly a lot of people that act that way and i think there's a lot of people that don't act that way and there's most people that act to help others as long as it's not going to be too much against their own interests um because well, because because the the way you describe that yeah great I think that's the Spider-Man quote, right? Great power brings great responsibility. Okay. <laughs> right, I think so. All right, uh, but it would be somewhat altruistic, right? If mm -hmm. um, a big, big state would use its resources to actually advance other states right. and other other political interests other right. than oneself, right? Yeah. And, it's and probably that's probably the biggest um, shock, or at least hindrance to being realist in a sense that but we do we do this all the time right we're always willing to say we want to help other people we just define those other people who are willing to help as our own countrymen right and i would say that that's an artificial creation we're all humans i'm willing to help all humans and i think increasingly mm -hmm. that mindset's setting in even if it's a minority but as long as it is a minority it's okay we can still argue it on the other level the selfish level we can say, yeah, maybe by helping Somalia, it's not going to help us a whole lot. But hey, maybe we only have to spend $10 million and suddenly this dysfunctional African state becomes a functional African state. It becomes the new Kenya. And in 10 years, we're going to be trading with them and it's going to vastly exceed our investment. This wasn't the saying that you cannot help others if you cannot help yourself. Yeah, sure. Let's use that. It's just that uh, you don't know when to stop helping yourself. Right? And say say well, that again. Well, in the sense that, yeah, you can help others effectively mm -hmm. yeah. once you have established that you can help yourself, right? right. But at what point is that, that, that enough, you yourself enough for yourself and right, then right. for others? Yeah. Who, who, who's to judge? Well, and that is, that is always a balance. Because I, I see, um, I would say, all, all episodes from last week tonight with John Oliver, mm -hmm. right? Just because I'm, I'm curious about, well, what do... Uh, those type of um, comedic, uh, sarcastic, uh, I don't know what to call it actually, but it's a comedy show in a sense, but still they talk about Political real comedy. issues, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, most of the time it seems to me that you can always find something to be worried about. Mm -hmm. It's just that what is your proposal for sol uh, for the solution? Right. And not the, not the theoretical best option, but the practical good right. enough option, right? right? And yeah, I always see that it it lacks most most of the critique that the that show brings, for instance, and many many others. I would say is just that the, all right. Here's the practical, good enough solution, mm -hmm. right? Not just well, but we could do it like this, and right. it doesn't have to be like that, and stuff like that. So it's just all right. What is the balance between those type of people who just who, who they criticize without providing solutions. Is that what you mean? Or at least effective solutions, yeah. Right. Because because in a sense, it would be it would be better not to say just, well, write your congressman, right, yeah, or something yeah. like that. But actually, look, here's the thing. If that happens, which is realistic, we can do that afterwards. Because right. um, I was uh, I found found it funny when he founded a church. Because mm -hmm. that was a great example of how actually the system works for right, right. religious organizations, right? Mm -hmm. But afterwards, he just, oh yeah, we just dismantle it, right. sell off something of the property, and that's about it. Right, but you could actually build a political party if you would like to. Yeah, you have a platform. Yeah. I mean, I, I think w without you know taking aside on John Oliver's show, I'd say just generally, I think those shows um, can do a service by bringing attention to issues. Right, we've got At so least, many issues, yeah. and I think education is key. And when you do have a democracy, that that means that you have to have a educated populace, which is maybe one of the issues right now is we don't look at complex issues with the amount of attention. Actually, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, actually the best indicator of that America is in a good spot, mm -hmm. is that you have all those shows that actually they mm -hmm. are yeah. free to actually criticize, make right. fun. Because right. you do that stuff in Russia, yeah, good luck. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Not for long. Right, exactly. So that's the best indicator for you guys to, to know, all right, we're still good. Right. That's all good. Well, and I would take it a step further, which is they don't have to provide reasonable solutions. Provide me with the best case scenario, and then we'll compromise on something less than that. 
right? In, in the 1950s, when, when uh, greater rights for feminists were being espoused, they were asking for the rights that they've effectively reached today. And you could say it took you 60 years to get to this level that you're at, or 70 years to get to this level that you're at today. That's a failure. But in reality, they were smart to aspire for that in 1950, knowing that if they reached for the top, they could get incrementally where they needed to be. If you start at the incremental level, you're going to compromise somewhere below that. And only if that was actually the strategy, but you never know. Maybe the strategy was... No, no, no. Maybe, we are for real. Right, we are for right, real. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, right. And then you are a fanatic. <laughs> and then, yeah. Or, but, but maybe they were right and they needed people that, that saw the big picture. Right? Yeah, but look at it this way. I mean, all, all ideologic political points need to have some buffer. Right? Well, then they did. They, they found compromise, right? That, that's the point. Is that yeah, they, and, it, and, it's just, and it's just the, have some bending. And it's just the big question whether or not something ever can happen that would go, go totally out of bounds. But I yeah. fo- found it quite interesting to read uh, the book Tower of Basel. It's, hmm. it's so, sort of about the oh, uh, okay. uh, Bank for International Settlements, right? Okay. Which, which was started, I guess, in the 30s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the 30s. And it was sort of made just to, uh, well, coordinate the reparations payment f- payments for, for Germany after Versailles, okay. right? But then the Nazi party took over. Then all those shady deals, those shady transactions, led one, one thing led to another. And all, lo and behold, uh, there was a dude with a funny looking must- mustache, right? Mm-hmm. Got into the chancellor yeah. uh, position. And then all hell broke loose, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just that, yeah, all those dudes at the BIS and the American branches of international banks, they knew about it. I mean, they literally worked together, made deals together, established business projects together. And it's funny that the author in the book makes every once in a while some commentary. Well, yeah, they had this private conversation or they wrote to each other these letters saying that, yeah, it's probably working out fine. Don't worry. It's not, it's not that crazy or right, something like right, that. Right. right. And, and at one point, oh no, I guess it's for real crazy. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. This is the appeasement model across, across Europe. And I guess the U S would be included in that as well. And that would be the question. Are you able to actually effectively provide a solution for that not happening again, especially in this day and age? I think integration, right? I, I think it that's that's what gave me a lot of inspiration was to see what was happening in the EU and it's um, a little bit dispiriting to see the the forces of nationalism again pulling at its edges. So I think the way to avoid it is, is cooperation and um, I've never seen that. I've never seen that in, in the sense that No, no, the, the whole world pr- is that you've seen this. The the, the, you, the very w- history of the world is increased cooperation. We went from economic e- cooperation you know, economic, political, cultural. All you, of you know, you know what the funny thing was, at least for me, uh, when I read uh, a book. I guess it was in the in the David Greber book, "Debt the Five Thousand for the First Five Thousand Years," okay. right? And so, so the basic premise for him was to say, look, if you look at study at least primitive cultures or cultures that are not affected necessarily by Western civilizations, what you find is this: the people they care about are not in economic relations with them, meaning people help each other out because they are people who care for each other. Right. But with those people who they don't care anything, they just trade, meaning you give me this for that. Exactly. Not more, not less. That's right. And that's it. Once we have the transaction, we just go and that, off our way and world. come back just for that's another still transaction. still our world today. Except now, yeah, you've got your core immediate family and friends, but if you're an American, you also have those other 300 million Americans that you consider in the same boat as you. That's greater integration. That's a huge difference from where we were at five or 10,000 years ago when you had your immediate tribe of 10 or 20 people and that was it. And so if we've expanded from 10 or 20 people to the size of entire countries, which is effectively where we're at now, there's no reason to think we can't go from countries to super nation, super national. I, I would guess actually that the biggest point would be to say now America or the world is at such a stage mm-hmm. that we actually can have decentralized governing mm-hmm. in a sense that you don't have 50 United States. Yeah. You have 50 states cooperating as a union. Could, could be. Right. And then actually all the regionalization, the localization 
gets even more intensive yeah but you are still cooperating with everybody else meaning but you yeah. still have your local identity right meaning right. the people you care about are the wall the those in your vicinity yeah and everybody else yeah you are let's say raised in a humanistic uh i, I prince, think you're conflating principle. culture and government though i, I mean isn't I, it isn't it one isn't I, I think historically they've rep governments have represented a people but i think the point that you're getting at is that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case we can have greater decentralization decentralization of government at a very local level in order to have more precision for instance while at the same time we can have people in that group saying you know what i'm an accountant that works at Price Waterhouse Coopers. I've got a lot in common with the accountant in Singapore that works at Price Waterhouse Coopers. We're a little band ourselves, right? We we are a little form um, that can represent our own interests. That's what we're having happening in the globalized world. Are you sure? Yeah. Because I'm an accountant, but I don't feel anything re relating to Singaporean <laughs> accountants. I'm not a Price 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 um, Price Waterhouse Cooper. Right? Yeah. Cooper, yeah, yeah. But still, I mean. I would be let's profession wise you could call me an accountant and a legal advisor mm -hmm. right but i don't feel i wouldn't feel anything just relating to a profession you know so we've seen this happen already we've seen it happen at the upper levels of the economic crust of the world the the people that are globe trotters that are traveling between all right right all the, right yeah so they're gonna say that they're gonna say i have more in common with this person who i see in the summers in london than i do with the people in the the town i happen to be born in okay and and that's filtered that's going to filter down over time even if it hasn't reached there yet those people are unbounded by nations because mm. they happen to have the wealth to exceed technology in a way that common people can't yet do but isn't it many times the need for them to actually establish bigger and better grounds for business advancement maybe but i think to, it's, for advancement of their own interests it's, right because because their the own pond is too small maybe and i i mean i would say i, I agree with that but and I don't then think it's that's, also i don't think that's all it is right you form your bonds with the people that you share the most in common with you're going to share more in common with the person that also is flying private jets and going to the Grand Prix in Monaco than the person that's back home eating fish and chips. Are you sure? I think it's happened. I think, I think for those people it's true. And I think for me I can say it's true that I feel like I have more in common with other well-read academics than with people that are from my hometown. I can love them, but I don't necessarily have a ton in common with them anymore. Oh, well, look, then you have just an intellectual uh identity and besides that uh, probably uh, some some form of emotional identity because intellectually yeah i totally agree i would have something similar with a singaporean a legal advisor or an accountant mm -hmm. but culturally in a sense that of the mentality attitude mm -hmm. i wouldn't be able to tell you what could possibly be similar Simply because, I think all right, the, the, the intellectual side of it is what's similar, right? I think those start mm. to those start to merge together at a certain time. How much do you, do you think the intellectual side governs our behavior? I would say not more than ten percent. So I think you're looking at it more strictly than I'm looking at it. All right. If if you're working in a white collar job in New York City, please, please, please I'm not I'm not quite uh, knowledgeable about that. So blue collar was the one who who the work with their hands. Yeah, yeah. And white that's, collar that's was sort of, with their mind. Sort of a complicated term, but yeah, white white collar is effectively you work with your mind, and blue, and blue collar, collar was kind of you work at the factory else. or something like that. Um, originally, yeah. Now, now it's sort of referred to as the the working class, quote unquote. Well, all right. Um, so college degree, think of that as sort of equivalent to to white collar mm -hmm. uh, all right. for my purposes. Um, but there was an article i don't remember where a few months ago about this saying the the bars that young professionals are going to in prague are almost identical to the ones they're going to in new york are almost identical to the ones they're going to in bangkok they're listening to the same kind of music they're watching the same shows they're dressing the same way All right. right this is a culture that is now going above and beyond a national culture and that's a new thing and that's what i'm talking about hmm I guess it was the, the, the same argument about MTV being all over the place. And nowadays you could say, well, yeah, of course, everybody is on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, looking at their smartphones on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then again, you still see, you still see many, many differences. Are you, are you basically saying, 
would, would you would you be expecting that the differences will get smaller and smaller and smaller i think so i would, so. I would say I they, so. they will get bigger and bigger and bigger simply because the technology allows you to isolate yourself yeah. well not necessarily intentionally but sort of unintentionally you can isolate yourself pretty much yeah yeah and certainly, culturally certainly and locally that's something that that is gaining more prominence is this idea that you can isolate yourself so i wouldn't say the future is certain i think that um greater integration of cultures has been happening for a while now and i think it if i were betting i would say i think it will continue um i'd probably bet a fair amount of money on that but only if you gave me a very long lead give me mm. 100 years give me 500 years it'll happen i don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20. we really need to ask google yeah we do I would imagine they have some plans to, for the 20 yeah. year future, 50 year future. They yeah. should have. We'll just call it Planet Google before long. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that um, everything, look, at that time when uh, feminism was an issue in America, was it the 50s, 60s? Uh, that oh. was sort of a resurgence, a renaissance of it. 50s, 60s was all, all over century. civil, civil exactly. activity, right? Yep. At that time, actually, America was still uh one the one place that innovated the most mm -hmm. made the big, biggest impact on the world uh, in the development of of wealth mm -hmm. in general so you could say that those idealistic civil rights movements they are not really causally linked to advancement of let's say the whole wealth of the nation or the world right why well, would you say that, all right, we did get so far without feminism, but with feminism, we'll, we'll get even more and faster. I think that's, that's faster. the point, right? I mean, it was Bill is Gates it? speaking. Is it? Yeah, Bill Gates I'll... was speaking before a crowd of Saudi Arabian people. You might have heard this story. No. Nah. And they asked him, you know, what can we do to be able to compete on the global stage? And he said, you see this room right now? And it was divided in two with a curtain and a small group of women on one side and the rest was men sitting there. Mm. So as long as this room is divided in two and the society is divided in two, you're not going to be able to compete at the global stage. I'm paraphrasing again. Mm -hmm. right, that's the general idea. What America was doing in the 40s and the 50s was great for that time, but it was the, the post-war years. They didn't have anyone to compete against. Now we do, and we do because it's a more equal world. So would you say that the same sort of argument, well, at least hypothetically, could be uh, presented at one point in time like uh, Isaac did about those ethnicities and having some form of empirical data that suggests some form of conclusions when it comes to these things? Because nowadays it's, it's just too early, I guess, right? Because it's not all over the world. You, It's difficult to actually have some form of controlled research to establish some empirical data, but maybe one point in time, you could literally say, all right, just because we gave such minority groups more civil rights, mm -hmm. this happened, this happened, and the, all, let's say the GDP just jumped, uh, something yeah. like that. Or maybe they will say, look, this happened, this happened, this happened, GDP started to actually e either slow down, yeah. Or maybe even reverse. You know, I because that would be. Ooh. I think this could be done to a certain degree, and I imagine there's people that have tried to do it. I think the problem would be mm. if you can show um, simply correlation, or if you can actually show causation. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, at this point, uh, it's but, I mean, hard the, to the, imagine the, the correlation. Is, that would be is pretty clear, right? I mean, if you go back to the most advanced economies in the world at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, say the early 1800s, their economies were a small fraction of what they are today. And they had a small fraction of their population that was actually contributing to the economy. I'd argue that what the sustainability of economies has been across time is as you get wealthier, more and more people are brought into that. Yeah, but see, then again, the past 200 years, or at least since the Industrial Revolution, all you see is just, yeah, some dude was quite interested in some topic. Mm hmm found out something, found out something more. One thing led to another. Boom, you have some steam engines, you have electric electricity, you have internet, yeah, you have but, all those but, things. So I would, I would imagine that those people who actually advance society from at least the technology side of it mm -hmm. or the opportunity side of it, they don't really think, they have never thought in those terms. Like the, no. the our Arabian dudes think, oh no, we need to divide ourselves. No, it's just oh look at that, this is interesting. Let's right. let's find out more. 
whoever can help me with that let's do it because everybody had uh, mothers right <clears throat> it's not like people hated uh, women it's just that all right the society is structured for instance that <clears throat> men go to school women stay at home and raise mm -hmm. kids right yeah. and it's that there you could probably find some some examples that still women fi found something interesting to do right yeah and didn't really give a damn whether or not politically it was acceptable or it was socially right. uh, usually common probably yeah but it's difficult to tell it's just uh, this is the new ground right yeah i mean i, I think the, the world we live in everyone has to be able to contribute right you can be you can be bill gates and put out microsoft but if you don't have thirty thousand well-educated people to run that company you're not going to be able to get very far um and, and I would also add that I, I don't think the, the innovator model of the U.S. is applicable in many other parts of the world. Right? Mm -hmm. if, if Lithuania were to take the U.S. approach, it would look something like this. It would say, okay, we're going to have some really good schools and we're going to really shoot for the sky. We're going to try to get these great inventors. The next Skype, which I think came out of Estonia, is that right? Yeah, Estonia, Finland. Okay. Maybe was, there. Okay. So Estonia, Estonia, what, what, Estonia, and an Estonian dude was definitely one of the founders, I guess. Okay. But yeah. we're we're gonna take this model. We're gonna hope that we get the next Facebook, the next Google, et cetera, et cetera. But it's only what two point five million people living here. So it's very possible you're gonna do this for twenty years, and you're not going to get anything to rise to that size because America's got three hundred million people. And so there's just a better chance that you're going to hit it once. And you only have to hit it once until you get the jackpot. That's how big these are. Here's the deal, though. Uh, Latvia and Lithuania combined would be, uh, I guess, a, a bit more than 4 million people, right? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the technology, it seems that Estonians being, I don't know, 1.5, mm -hmm. a bit less ma maybe, have, uh, have more to show than we combined, right? Mm -hmm. And then you then you ask, well, what would what could be the reason? Because in a sense, we live in the same all, all quite common or similar political systems. Right. We had quite similar history. Right. The biggest difference is that we don't have the same language branch. Okay. Right. Maybe there's an argument for that. Which language branch are you born into? What's your native language? And how does that affect, for instance, your ability to generate new thoughts? Because I would argue, and I, it's just my theory, mm -hmm. I would argue all the Germanic languages mm -hmm. are best suited to be actually more capable in doing intellectually demanding things. Wow. And being either exactly in a sense that technology-wise or even in arts. Why? Simply because it seems to me that the best technology and uh, best art well yeah it's relative right to, to speak about best art but still the the musical and artful pieces came from german speaking or english speaking countries mm -hmm. now that might be only because th those were the most wealthy ones right? right but why were they the most wealthy ones just because they were mo the most advanced technology wise to conquer everybody else or to, you know to rule everybody else well, they, they happen to be the most advanced um you know starting in the 1500s or so right so how did but, that but, happen that's but, that's what i'm asking right, but but how did your theory explain the fact that up until the 1500s from you know approximately the fall of the roman empire in 500 until 1500 it was the the muslim world that was dominant that we had vast empires across southeast asia um, that prior to the rise of the Romans, um, it was the Persians that were dominating. Uh, we had empires out of Egypt, out of Tunisia, all of these different places when, when Europe was, was nothing. Um, so I think that history Well, it was is, isolated from the popular trade routes, but it probably wasn't really nothing. Well, so, right? so we, maybe they're isolated and the Romans reconnect them, but then after the Romans f fell, it wasn't sustained, right? Because it, it's, it's just that, look... You know, you probably know the mind game, right? You 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 see a picture with I don't know, let's say, a red dots, green dots, and a yellow dots, mm -hmm. and then so, then somebody asks you, count, pl please count the red dots, and then you see, all right, uh, you you count those, right? And then they ask you, well, how many yellow dots did you see? None. Well, I was looking, I wasn't looking for yellow dots. What, what do you mean? Right. Right. I think history is full of it. <clears throat> and many times i mean in the sense that yeah look rome 
or before that ancient Greece so they brought these things they established these things all these philosophers and so on. I think it's too simplistic in a way that yeah of course that's the way the the probably the oral tradition at first then the written tradition was handed uh, but probably all over the world you had smart people exactly right? right it's just that who as a culture establishes the thing that creates the advancement systematically mm -hmm. right every once in a while uh, let's say every once in a, in a million people you'll get an Einstein maybe right but if you get a culture around it that actually advances every bit of potential you have as a, yeah. as a kid as a, as a human being you might get uh, 200 Einsteins from that yeah, same population. No, I, mean, I, I think, I think <laughs> and I think that the German Germanic languages are best suited for that purpose. Okay. Just because once you talk in Germanic language and that includes English, right? It allows you to think more freely about things in a sense that oh, maybe there's not a word for it, but you can create one instantly. It yeah. almost and you can feel intuitively that you don't have to be fearful of, of something new. You can mm -hmm. create even in, with your words, yeah. right? And that allows you to actually advance. Oh, yeah, we can we can do also more. Why can't other <laughs> languages do that? Well, I would argue that the the synthesizing of new words is the most crucial aspect. As and I'm not no linguist, so I don't know how other languages will work, but I definitely know that the German language is quite well adapted to just creating new words instantly and when you read i don't know goethe mm -hmm. you can definitely see just oh yeah he just he made a word up and it it was instantly understandable yeah nobody would ask you no where did you read that Shakespeare what, did this was well, it right? was it was it in the dictionary beforehand that you used yeah. the word right whereas in the latin language <clears throat> we use it all the time yeah we are many times uh people will sort of um well they will not necessarily criticize, but they will definitely ask, what, what, what did you mean with that? There's no word for that. There's not, as if you made some stupid mistake, right? Mm -hmm. you, you said something that was directly uh, reasonable, right? And everybody understood it, but mm -hmm. yeah, never, never have you or them heard of it. Yeah. So actually that would be the point to say, oh, good, right. That, that's a suitable word for it for instance mm -hmm. yeah. right but yeah that that's the thing our mentality many times is no that word is not in a dictionary man yeah. so there's no word for it that's a wrong word yeah so yeah. no you don't use that word you use two words together to describe the one right, right? right. whereas the german would say all right bum 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 mm -hmm. and that's a new word then here you go yeah. right and i think that's a that's quite a small uh, difference but still it makes a for a for a I think it makes for a more creative mind. Hmm. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm reminded of a study saying that um, Mandarin makes it easier to do math. Um, I've heard of something similar, yeah, that so, the Asian uh, population is better at math. Yeah. But I'm not sure whether or not that helps creatively because they, well, so, they so steal my, my those point Apple maybe, patents left and right, right? So maybe there are um, you know, linguistic effects that are out there, but ultimately I think the development of societies is, is hugely complex. And I think there's so many different factors feeding into it that it's hard to identify what caused what. Um, of course, it's just a guess. I, mean, I, I would more. say that just as, a, as maybe a counter example would be if you do look at ancient Greek society, um, you see that Socrates was quickly followed by Plato, his own student, who was quickly followed by Socrates, who was his student. And this was um, part of a long philosophical tradition in ancient Greece, which was uh, you know, rather undeveloped 2,500 years ago, relatively speaking. Um, and I think what that shows is that um, culture and ideas are incubated. And the more you have, the more you have. Um, and conversely, we can compare that with the Roman Empire that was economically vastly more powerful, militarily vastly more powerful, and effectively has no philosophical tradition that arose out of all that time they were there. They had historians, they had poets, they had playwrights, they don't have famous philosophers. They didn't have them there. They didn't have the, the Plato's I think, to get the tradition well, started. Seneca would be probably the best. Of, well, Cicero so as well. So Cicero was more of an orator. Um, I, I'm not sure about Seneca. Um, they have the... Um, At least for the culture of Europe, 
culture. Yeah, cer- certainly, but but philosophy they have. Well, uh, also uh, in, in in the same breath, I would say uh, philosophical thought. Yeah, but these these are different uh, different fields, so to speak, right? So my my point is uh-huh. that Rome was able to surpass ancient Greece in, in all of these different ways, but in this one narrow area, ancient Greece was superior, right? And it happened to be that that's where they had the the minds that incubated the minds. It's a, it, I think it, this is how the world works. You you start the industrial revolution in England, and now. You've got the machines that have been created. You create the next machines that follow. You use your economic power to further entrench your economic power, and then you're the British Empire. Same thing's happening in the U.S. with technology today. I think it depends really who are your teachers and who do they concentrate on. Because Mm -hmm. I think at one point in time or several points in time, somebody had to choose, all right, we will talk about the dude called Socrates. Yeah, we don't have any of his writings, but yeah, we have writings about his writings or right. something like that, right? right. So, uh, yeah, but it's just that it's not that he maybe was uh, stupid or anything. It's just that probably he has he had some peers who are equally qualified to speak about topics. It's just mm-hmm. that somebody at one point in time concentrated on him more. Right. Maybe it was more uh, more comfortable. Well, not more uh, convenient. Right. Maybe it was the only physical option to do because right. nobody else was left. Uh, but yeah, it's still that. Uh, all right, there are different examples, of course. Yeah, it's just difficult to grasp whether or not it represents the full picture. Well, I think I think to a certain degree that emphasizes the point, right? Because wouldn't you say that Greece nowadays is sort of culturally not quite um, different from, let's say, other Mediterranean? countries i don't know, you know um, what i mean i don't i don't know drinking enough. wine yeah i, I don't know relaxing, enough about greek, chilling. greek culture yeah yeah i mean I, they, I don't know that they've got uh modern day plato's maybe greeks would disagree well they do philosophize all over that's for sure but that's you know funny thing is the the biggest well and this is just just um i don't know not me being uh comedic about it but the biggest quote-unquote philosophers or people who just like to philosophize i've seen from the mediterranean countries and russia hmm. okay yeah i've heard i've heard russia and and it's just that yeah at one point in time philosophy might might be a useful topic to discuss as a, as an isolated topic mm-hmm. but nowadays you can say everything is philosophical in in a sense that you cannot isolate yourself from the world and mm-hmm. you cannot isolate an idea from the thoughts of other people before you after you and beside you you can't have the you can't have the world without you can't have philosophy without the world but you can have the world without philosophy i guess right? that's i guess the, the that's the same uh, token about uh, whether or not people have free will mm-hmm. right right but i don't get that honestly cuz cuz that seems like something that doesn't lead to an answer it just right, leads right. to other questions <laughs> right which and is then, which one of the, the and the point is not to hmm? which is one of the issues at the root of the reformation of memory serves that so, document over free will yeah so in a way you have you have the option to discuss many many things but in a sense all right what is that what we want and i would argue only anthropologists are the uh, well suited for that at least academically speaking because mm-hmm. i remember and maybe it was the same for you uh, when when it comes to legal studies mm-hmm. it was more or less like uh, a recital of current uh, legal norms mm-hmm. and a bit of history well how they came to be mm-hmm. whereas in a sense we are not learning today to know tomorrow everything from yesterday mm-hmm. we're actually learning to establish the knowledge of tomorrow mm-hmm. right and it's in a sense that's something where you need an attitude mm-hmm. a mentality mm-hmm. and i guess that might be lost in many humanities the the focus on the future you mean yeah why well simply because it becomes a career it becomes a career and you live f- today Mm-hmm. for today's needs yeah and at what point in time will you be that plato sitting back thinking about the future right, right and actually thinking about a result in the future yeah and acting accordingly today for that purpose because otherwise it will be the same as for those 
uh, fat Kuwaitis, right. right? Just sort of knowing what to do, how to do it, but then again, not thinking about the future. Well, if I continue to do this like that, right, right. so you are, isn't it called cognitive dissonance? Mm -hmm. That you you actively choose not to actually engage in right, that kind right. of thinking, yeah. even though you it's somewhere lurking right for your right, in your right. mind but you still just actively choose not to yeah. and maybe go uh, around and you know try to entertain yourself with something just to pass the time yeah short short term motivations are more powerful than long term motivations we want a dollar today more than we want a dollar 50 in a year from now right and the biggest uh, was that we fear we fear losing a dollar than gaining right, right, the, the, exactly. the excitement is more <laughs> loss, of, loss of the fear yeah yeah yeah. So I would say probably anthropologists, psychologists would yeah. be the new Plato's. Well, yeah. sort of. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. I think that. Um, but all those legal I scholars. I think psychologists almost, almost the most. And maybe evolutionary psychologists, to be very precise. I'm not sure what that uh, entails. So effectively trying to describe um, how the way we think today is linked to um, the survival of the fittest idea. So, it seems like you could put a lot of ideology behind it and uh, pass it as science. You could. Um, At and, least and sounds I'm sure like it. People try to. Um, I'm I'm a believer in the the academic system, and I think if you're going through the peer reviewed process, then you're going to possibly have some bias involved. But I think the um, number of experts that are involved in the process of validating an academic article, um, before which it's going to reach people like my ears. Um, is the best we have, even if it's not foolproof. Would you say it's the same quality for the exact sciences and the humanities? Because many times people complain about the humanities being actually quite subjective, quite, yeah, yeah. quite, uh, I don't know, tribal-minded or yeah, conspiratory yeah. even. Yeah, <clears throat> um, there are attempts being made, to my understanding, to put them on a more equal footing. And I think that attempt is at a fairly well-developed place, which is the process of quantifying everything, including things that we wouldn't have thought were possible to quantify. Yeah, then... And that, just... If you quantify, if you make it mathematical, that, in, that incorporates subjectivity because 2 plus 2 always equals 4. But that's wishful thinking, right? Um, I think it's imperfect thinking. I think the idea, the wish, the wish is, is, is good. And I think the idea... To quantify us, everything? Um, not to quantify everything without having qualifications, but to attempt to quantify as much as possible in order to increase objectivity while acknowledging that we won't be able to do so in a perfect way. I think that's an endeavor worth following. See, that's one of, the, one of those things I always thought about, for instance... <clears throat> How was how was the dude called in the wheelchair? The, the astrophysicist Stephen Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, right? I always thought, how come at one point in time, if you are such a brilliant mind, mm -hmm. right, and you find out that you have such a horrible disease, mm -hmm. <coughs> how come at one, at that point in time, you still decide, yeah, I'm going to pursue a career in astrophysics or whatever. Right. If I would be a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant dude. And I have something that only a few people in the world have. Yeah. It's so unknown, so it's so debilitating, but still, I would feel, yeah, maybe I'm the best guy to actually solve this problem. Yeah. Maybe I should focus on the matter at hand. Right, right. right? Yeah, <laughs> Who true. cares about the stars at this point? Right. Right. And I was wondering that how come if you're such so so smart, you didn't you didn't really pay your most your, yeah. your biggest attention to the issue at hand yeah yeah right? i mean I, I think that's that's probably going against evolution right he was probably fighting that basic survival instinct but maybe that fits if you become an astrophysicist you by definition see the world as something much bigger than you and can you imagine if it's if, if a psychologist comes along and says well according to my diagnostic methodology it was cognitive dissonance it was just he didn't want to he go didn't. that route simply right, because right. He, he was fearful of, yeah. of what might happen. Yeah, in which case the world's better off for it. <laughs> yeah, but then again, you have all the same patterns uh, repeating it once themselves in different fields. Yeah. And then you imagine, well, but look, you have such, such and such a skill set. Mm -hmm. That would be the best part to actually quantify. 
You have mm-hmm. such and such a skill set. There's a such and such a problem. Yeah. Those match best. Yeah. Go yeah. do it. Yeah. And we as a society reward you for it. Right. X, I mean, Y, and Z. We talked earlier about decentralizing <laughs> governance. And I think these are all linked together with the, the big data that we're now in the ocean swimming around in, right? As we've got all of this information that's out what, there. What is considered big data? I'm not really sure. Um, it's the ability to collect information in much bigger ways than we would have ever been able to do before. So just as an example, we can... But don't you like the fact that you could actually... <clears throat> let's say I've heard of people saying that they have at home that um, Amazon Alexa, right? Right. That they speak about something yeah. and then afterwards it pops up as an ad advertisement somewhere. Right, right. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It it's, is great. Yeah. It's there's, fantastic. There's, there's risks if it goes too far, which I guess is the concern you're hinting at, but I agree with you. It, in and of itself, it's a very useful device. Yeah, because then they, the, the, the particular products, for instance, that you actually want or need, they yeah. find you. Yeah. Simply yeah. because of your behavior. Yeah. Right? It's great. Yeah. It's uh, great. They're maybe creating a, a sense of materialism that wasn't there before, right? You're, they're making you want things that you didn't even think you wanted. Which... Oh, now, now you're talking Fight Club. No, no, it's on Fight okay. Club. Right? I haven't seen that movie in a yeah. while. Well, you, yeah, you. What was the quote? You, you start to own things that that start to own you, right? Or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. Which Fight Club? Ah, the things you own thing. start owning you. Right. Right. That was the quote. Yeah. Well, it's a thoughtful movie for sure. It is. When it comes to materialism, consumerism. Yeah, yeah. It's just that whether or not we really don't like consumerism, I would argue strongly against it. I think we do like consumerism. We just don't like the fact that we are so weak minded because <laughs> we, cause we like to think of, yeah, no, for sure. of, of many, many things idealistically, yeah. like heroically, yeah. right? Yeah, we can, we can definitely put up with this and, you know, go through all this trouble and the, right. but really we just want the l- path of least resistance right. and the most comfy. But that, that's evolutionary psychology <laughs> again, right? So I can say. And anthropology as well. How, how anthropology? Because the anthropologist would just say, all right, here, these are the things that people say. Yeah. So they are quantifiable because yeah. and exactly identifiable. Mm-hmm. And these are people and these are things that people do. <clears throat> what we notice yeah, somehow yeah. those don't match many right, times. Right. right. So yeah. what do we pay attention to mostly? Yeah. Uh, the anthropologists argue the things they do. Right. And they don't put up put any um, any interpretation in it. And they just say, look, it's a fact. Mostly they act like this, they do this and that. Right. Now, at one point you can start hypothesizing, well, how come, right? Right. And then and you that, see those that's similarities. The, that's the evolutionary psychologist. But then take so. it one step further. Where does the philosopher come in? The philosopher says what ought to be, right? So I can say, really? yeah, that's, that's what philosophy is. What ought to be? Not what is, but what ought to be. So I can say. Are you sure? I thought philosophy is the love of knowledge. <laughs> I would I would make that more broad. I would say the humanities is the love the love of knowledge. But I th- I think I, th- I really really think that even the word was meant to be love of knowledge. Okay. Uh, or the uh, yeah a knowledge lover. In, in any event, what ought to be wouldn't be the entire definition, right? Because be what component. ought to be what ought to be are politicians. So, okay. Well, so what ought to so be? Let me be more precise. <laughs> Ethics is a subset of philosophy, right? And ethics asks what ought to be. It so, might be it might be the case that there's a, probably a philosophical debate about whether or not ethics should be philosophical or any right I would imagine because because there's probably some circular logic type of thing. <laughs> well, so because <clears throat> ethics, I mean, you are a human being. Yeah. You didn't choose to be, you know, five foot eleven or well, you probably over six foot, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> you didn't choose that. Right. But there were all those natural forces inside of you and outside of you that right. somehow created and molded you, right? right? <clears throat> and then again, you still see some similar patterns, right? right? Maybe somebody is not exactly as tall as you, but you see he has also two eyes, right? And two ears and all, right. all of those jazz. So, and somehow all you both feel more comfortable uh, in, I don't know the Fahrenheit, but do you know Celsius? Yeah. So somehow both of you feel more comfortable at plus 25 Celsius, right. which is like all today, yeah. uh, than um, below zero, right? right? Somehow it's uh, it's so similar, right, right, between them. So either way, it seems to me there's a small gap 
between the minimum and the maximum level of <clears throat> action people take in a sense that the difference is so small mm -hmm. right so te the temperature the environment all your reactions to it your physical physiological reactions they will be so common across the board yeah then that's just that's just debate whether or not ethics is really um a, a principle or a discipline of the mind we'll or rather that. or rather than just natural reaction i mean that that was my opening point that i think that people um naturally <laughs> biologically share a lot in common but um environment has a big effect too and we can see that i mean you can compare a gandhi to a hitler and, and i think that that I, th I think i think you i think you mentioned gandhi as a as a symbol almost right yeah, for, yeah. for for a specific attitude but i think gandhi had some nice skeletons in his closet maybe i think so i mean uh, i'm not sure but i know he was a legal uh, person as well yeah. right but i think he had some some funny funny things yeah. right and because uh, i remember hearing an audiobook saying well what do you associate with this 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 and then says well probably not the famous mahatma gandhi right <laughs> but then he goes on to explain well look everybody has their past everybody has their actions that might not be so favorable when it comes to the wide reception of those personas yeah right but that's that's just the fact that yeah people are people humans are humans mm -hmm. right and don't put anybody on a pedestal no i completely right? agree so no, so no yeah the, so the argument would be all right so symbolically yeah mahatma gandhi hitler told the opposite yeah but then again maybe they had just same same uh, needs just different differently uh acted out well so so i think what we can see ethics doing is take your base right your base ethics of who you are whether it's at the hitler level or whether it's at the gandhi level or use whoever you prefer as the person that you think is the best and worst people to be alive on this earth Doesn't and whatever that base is you can use ethics to be better than that natural inclination would be right doesn't ethics mean that somebody will make a judgmental decision yeah oh that's good that's bad of course of course yeah which is a big debate within ethics is the idea of whether we're going to have a universal conception of what is right or whether we're going to take a relativistic perception and say i can say what's good you can say what's good we can completely disagree and we can both be right so there's no right then according to the relativ relativistic perception according to the universalistic perception there is one right at all times in all places for all people I personally come out somewhere in between which means none at all uh no for that me that means that there are uh why universal are values and why that are, the way why are there acted upon is what differs uh have you ever thought about why are there um specific disciplines when it comes to academics mm -hmm. that distinguish between oh this is the school of this thought and this right. is the school no 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 maybe you just think all right what are the facts mm -hmm. what are the conclusions and maybe don't uh, identify with any particular group because yeah. then you uh, run the risk of groupthink. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, this goes back to your earlier question about humanities, although I imagine we're seeing these subfields and the sciences as well. Um, how, do you, how do you quantify what is ethical, right? And as long as you're purely in the philosophical realm, people are going to disagree about what they think is right. Um, I would argue that the most talented thinkers out there straddle the lines and don't get sucked into one way of thinking or another, but recognize that value can be brought from a lot of different areas. So would you say that um, legal profession or, or many other humanities are well suited for that? Um, to, to think, think outside uh, the boundaries? Maybe more than many professions, yes. I, I think that um, one of the things I've enjoyed about the transition from practicing law to being can, can you sw sw switch on the light yeah to being involved Thanks. in uh, you know, spending a lot of my time researching is that it's fun for me to be able to jump between different fields in a way that um in law i was going to be very narrowly focused for 40 years so that's my personal perspective and i think you can take it to the broader perspective too and see that academia is increasingly rewarding this interdisciplinary uh, style. If you want to teach in a law school, for instance, and you have a PhD from the business school or better yet from the school of economics, then you're going to be more highly employable than if you just have a law degree even from Yale. Actually, uh, you know what? I actually think that lawyers on average are better economists than economists. Why is that? 
I just think that they get indoctrinated with too much that's not really research based. Hmm. And uh, and again, I go back to anthropology because they, I mean, maybe it was even the same that the first 5000 years book because it was quite dense with uh, references and hmm. tough, tough academic long language. Hmm. Sometimes I, I really needed to use a dictionary. Okay. Uh, but um, the whole point was the, th- the thought of Adam Smith, for instance, uh, with the invisible hand, mm-hmm. it was just a sort of a philosophical thought. Yeah. But, well, at least he said so. Even he, the the author, admitted he had no reference in reality. Mm-hmm. It was just a thought uh, based on his observation, mm-hmm. right? A, 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 a guess, in a sense. But it further took on the the real principle. Right. It right. was it was established as a real principle, and right. now that principle is a f- almost a fundamental basis for other principles, theories, right. in economics. He had happened to him what Gandhi had happened to him. Any famous person has happened to them over time. As you mold over the little nooks and crannies of their thought, you lionize them and you simplify them and say, "This is what they stood for. This was a great man. Therefore, this is what we should do." Yeah, on both on and what uh, the anthropologist said was. If we look at the facts, mm-hmm. then yeah, we see a, t- a bit different picture. But the different picture would mean that most of the economic policy thinking is based on um, wishful thinking most of the time, or not mm-hmm. really uh, empirical evidence at all. Mm-hmm. It's just that can we agree on this, like an, yeah. on a consensus basis? Yeah. So if you if you educate people on a consensus basis right and people don't question whether or not there should be a consensus when it comes to different topics it's just that yeah you just breed some yes sayers or yes men yeah right and yeah well that was was his whole critique well not a critique but he basically laid out that look here are the things we can definitely say for sure Mm -hmm. these are the things that people act that they did that they do still yeah and these are the research materials that we can get about the basis for economics in many, many fields. Right. And I, I saw that myself, at least when it comes to the fiat money uh, topic. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we still have uh, even textbooks uh, claiming, yeah, look, uh, the central banks uh, create all the money and then it goes into circulation, right? And And, yeah, you need to really specifically look for uh for instance the term credit money right to actually see oh actually every credit institution in the world can create money just because of the credit lending operation right yeah but it's something that wasn't really discussed 100 years ago Mm -hmm. even though the operation in itself has been ever probably around ever since the medicis Mm -hmm. right it's just that yeah who who establishes the first ground for any new academic discipline right because, I mean, probably Smith, at that time, he wasn't called an economist, right? He was just a philosopher. Right. But then he's considered the first econ- economic writer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, never mind, right? Yeah. At one point, everybody has to start. Right, right. And I then the it. discipline evolves. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, I think most of the time it's, uh, it's being uh, mentioned when it comes to the policies that, the, for instance, IMF mm-hmm. does. And maybe this goes back to your topic of actually having the Peace Corps mm-hmm. and having having all different types of uh, countries involved mm-hmm. and and trying to help other other countries right mm-hmm. so the I guess the basic premise would be needed to be correct right to actually help those people and so what is the hmm what is the what's what's it what's the not litmus test but still what's the what's the test what's the signs that you say, oh yeah, this definitely works for sure. Yeah. Right? These are the results. We, we see them constantly improve, improve, improve. Because I remember I had once a, a Jamaican girl over here. Mm-hmm. And she said she was um, helping in some, I don't know, Azerbaijan or something like that. Because uh, there the women are really oppressed. And the men have full authority ab- about them. So or I said, well, that's terrible. So what do you do? Well, we help them to get out of the uh, family so do you and I asked him well do you help them to get establish a new life or the well basically no we, we try to inform them out about the possibilities and options <laughs> so we, we talked to for quite a bit and then I asked him well 
do I understand correctly that you basically take them out of the the whole context of their whole being? Mm-hmm. You tell them a bit that life is about more than just that, mm-hmm. but you really don't give them the tools to actually start the new life. You just say, well, good luck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we took you out of those miserable conditions. And right. I asked her, wasn't, wasn't that the fact that you considered that the miserable condition? Mm-hmm. In a sense that, yeah, of course, it's somehow uh, judgmental to say uh, other people live more poorly than you or in, in less favorable conditions than you. Mm-hmm. But if those people are unaware of other conditions, right? Because right. I always tell, uh, uh, ask people, how come that they're in the 21st century are still Eskimos around? Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense any any sense. If I would be an Eskimo, if I would ask you, how would you like to spend 365 days just freezing every day? Right. Right. Yeah, sounds fine. Right. Nobody um, chooses that. Yeah. Yeah, but somehow they continue to do that. Yeah. I guess the population is, is diminishing. I would guess so. Yeah. Right. But still, that people was like, no, I'm fine. Right. I, I can continue. Yeah. Right. And then it's just, have you been to the Caribbean? Right? Yeah. What do you mean? Have you? Oh, yeah. No, no. For the Eskimo, right? right? right. You wouldn't go back. Right. You wouldn't like to go back. Right. Have you have ever experienced yeah, but, but Wi-Fi? Maybe they would. Right. You know? I mean, people people are remarkably flexible. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. If if that person doesn't have a really uh, an emotional attachment right. to, to, let's say, better conditions right. or conditions more suitable to the physiologic needs of the person, right? If, it, if he doesn't emotionally actually know that feeling, know right. that... He's not bothered by that thought, right? right? right. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm good here. I, I think you're, you're hitting at the balance that has to be struck with that sort of thing, right? I mean, you, if you go to Saudi Arabia where women are only now being able to, to drive or in the near future should be able to, um, I'm glad that's happening. And if there are women that still don't want to drive, fine. I'm not going to say you have to drive, but I'm glad you have the choice to drive if you would like to. Funny enough, that's the that's the, the discussion point. To, I would imagine the first things first rule would be, all right, maybe we should concentrate on the beheading part mm-hmm. of the culture and then just try women drivers. <laughs> yeah. But let's, what, let's just set the priorities. I'm not setting the agenda though, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, but, it's, but how come that the, the discussion point is, oh, look at that, women have a uh, right to drive. You know, I, th- I think because it's little gains, right? You, you're, you're maybe. Not, I you're hope not, so. I'm not going to say so. Saudi Arabia, you're doing be, everything right. I'm going to say this cool. is a right first step. It would be cool if it turns out that having women drivers leads to something, then then that leads to something. Yeah. And at the end of it, no beheadings. Yeah. Right? That, yeah, would, be, that, that would, would be, be wonderful. Interesting. Yeah. I guess the only time can tell. So, uh, actually, so the question was, so... Should the Peace Corps have a program of taking Eskimos to the Caribbean? <laughs> um, I think for the sake of the Eskimos, yes, that, that should happen. I think they should learn to surf. They could probably teach those people a lot. I would imagine how to catch a fish just by bare That's hands. Right. That's right. How to make a canoe out of a seal skin. Be very cool. I think everyone would benefit. So what is the thing you are planning to do? And uh, was it Kyrgyzstan? Uh, so I was in Kyrgyzstan, and um, what what is the uh, end goal for you then? So in August, I go to the University of Florida, and I start an organizational behavior PhD program. Oh, so you're going back to America and staying in America? I am. I ah, am. I understood. I understood that you are planning to still go to. I was. So I was in Kyrgyzstan for the last three years. Um, Kyrgyzstan for three years and then Budapest for four months. I'll do this for five years and then um, my research will be cross-cultural research. So I should be able to stay uh, focused on cultures across the world. So what are the, what are the results for you then in Kyrgyzstan? Three years, you probably had some, uh, some gains. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I hope, hopefully my students gain something. I guess time will tell on, on that front. Um, probably never will be able to quite determine that but in the event it was fulfilling for me well what was the let's say when you first arrived there yeah what was the let's say intention the aim the the goal and how did you the goal was to to get my foot in the academic door and i became an assistant professor at an american university there which led to uh, the phd program i'm attending so from a purely strategic viewpoint it was a success oh but oh so that was the main goal to yeah, actually to, well, act, to actually go abroad to have a better outcome uh, at home 
Um, not necessarily at home, but yeah, I wanted to be able to be involved in teaching. I find teaching to be a, a wonderful experience and without having um, a PhD, it was going to be difficult to do that in the U.S. and I was mm -hmm. able to do that in Kyrgyzstan. And I got the double that's benefit so of... That's so, that sounds... I mean, if a Kyrgyzstani dude would, uh, would tell me, yeah, I went to the U.S. to actually uh, establish my PhD and yeah, yeah. it sounds real reason, <laughs> but when an American says, well, I went to Kyrgyzstan to establish. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I mean, so it, it sounds so unlikely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just was kind of one of those, those flukes, one of those coincidences. It, a coincidence even? Um, you know, the way, the way so things So you had developed. many options in a sense. I, yeah. You could have gone to there, there Kazakhstan. And I could have not done Peace Corps. I could, I could have not done academia. I, there were a lot of different things I was interested in. Well, but in. you wanted to do academia. That's for, for, for sure, I right? Did, but it I, I it think, wasn't that you specifically chose Kyrgyzstan. I think like the Eskimo, there's a lot of different things I could have done that would have made me happy. No, no. But what I mean is the academia part was definitely the important thing. But mm -hmm. Kyrgyzstan wasn't necessarily the important thing, right? Um, you could have gone to, I don't know, <sighs> Turkey. Whatever. I suppose so. I, I was given Kyrgyzstan from a from a list of three. Um, what were the other two? It was Namibia and Peru, and uh, I believe. Yeah, maybe Peru would be interesting. Namibia I, probably I, not so I much. Spoke right. Spoke some Spanish back in the day, so Peru appealed. Namibia, you don't have to learn a new language, and I'm not a linguist, so that was kind of appealing. And I think I first. Wait, why why wouldn't you need a new language in Namibia? They're they're going to speak English in large numbers there. Yeah. Namibia? Yeah, they don't even teach you a new language when you when you go over there, the the Peace Corps. Whereas the program everywhere, most places, you have a three month I, intensive language course. I need to look up look up uh, yeah, at the Wikipedia and Namibia. To me. Yeah. So I, I first emailed them. And I said uh, Namibia is my first choice. I think it was Namibia, then Peru, then Kyrgyzstan. And uh, about three days passed, and I emailed them back after having done some research on Kyrgyzstan and said I switched that. Kyrgyzstan is my number one choice. So what changed? Um, so I remember that one of the first things I did was I went on the, um, world Factbook put out by the CIA uh -huh. and, uh, you know, it's always this very dry language they use to describe countries, 4.5 mm -hmm. million people and GDP per capita. And the first line was something along the lines of one of the most beautiful countries in the world, sometimes considered the Switzerland of Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was appealing. It's a beautiful mountainous country. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very interested in, uh, Soviet history. Um, it's also a really poor place. It's a GDP per capita of something like 1500 per person. Um, so not all like the Swiss, Switzerland of not, Central Asia? Way, not at all. Because Kazakhstan is probably quite well off. It is, yeah. I think it's ten or 12000 right now, and that's after oil prices collapsed. Much nicer place. Um, and so for me, I wanted, to, I wanted to go to a place where I would really see and to a certain degree experience poverty. Um, are Ki are Kyrgyzy people like Asians? Uh, yeah, they're um, they're ethnically related to the Mongols and so East Asians for so the most part. Everybody like this, right? A bit, because uh, no, because no Kazakhs. Uh, Kazakhs they, as they well. Have that yeah, um, with uh, maybe five or ten percent Russians, and then as a result of uh, the Russian ethnicity being there for a while, you've got a certain degree of intermixing as well. Really? So a bit of a unique looking people. I kind of thought that yeah, Russia of course is a is a big country, but mm -hmm. those real real Russians, uh, those are only in up to the Ural Mountains. No, no, they, uh, they I kind were, of they thought were, that they were relocated there. I mean, as, as well as you know, Ukrainians and, and people from across the Soviet Empire were relocated during I guess Stalin's days. Because mm -hmm. those people in Siberia, they don't look anything like I think anything like. Uh, more, more, more Asian looking. Yeah, yeah, right? definitely, for yeah, sure. Yeah. That's what I mean. It, technically, it's, yeah, of course, you could say one country, but then again, mm, mm. not necessarily one ethnicity, not, right. not one nation. Right. Not, right. not, not like that. Right. Big so, Muslim population in Chechnya. So Kyrgyzstan attracted you with uh, mountains? Mountains, with the nature, history. And the poverty. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. now I, I get it. I get it. Because, but look, you wouldn't like to really permanently live there, right? Probably. Um, I Probably. think, it, you know, I, I honestly loved it. I, there wasn't a part of me that was excited to go. There was only, hmm. there's only nostalgia down that I am gone. Um, I think in the long term it would have been difficult to integrate without finding a spouse to help with that process. So, um, but yeah, I think you could live, I, I think that taught me that I could live pretty much anywhere and be happy. Oh, well, of course. Did you have communications? Yeah. Like internet? Yeah, yeah. See, I think that's a big, big deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that was the lesson, I guess, is that 
I would often, especially after I'd had a couple beers, I'd sit there and I'd say, this is supposed to feel weirder. You know, I'm in Kyrgyzstan, but it feels so normal. My world is so normal. I've got Netflix. I've got Wi-Fi. I just talk to my family back home and all these people around me, I know them. They're Kyrgyz people that I'm friends with, you know. Mm-hmm. The yeah, world normalizes well, quickly. And it's probably only, what, the past 15 years? To the to this level, yeah. I would say even less than that. When I was first abroad in maybe 2008, it was more difficult then, right? I, now I can walk on the streets. I did it on the, the way back here today, actually. I got a Skype call from a friend or a Facebook messenger call, whatever. Mm-hmm. And just while I'm walking in the park, could take that call. It's so easy. Yesterday, the Canadian dude <clears throat> said that all over China, you can see vendors. Well, that didn't surprise me that much. But he said even beggars who don't take cash. Really? They just they just put up a, a QR code, and then you can either pay for your sausage or you, you can put up yeah. your donation. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's just just ridiculous. What, what there is a country in this part of the world that's getting rid of their their bills entirely. What? Who? Yeah, I don't know. Finland. N- haven't Estonia. heard of it. Okay, it's, it hasn't it. happened. It sounds was like, like a an interesting thought. Something. Sounds like an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah, but can you imagine having a beggar just with a QR code? That's crazy. Not like this, but like yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scan it. That's why. Scan it if you want help. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he said yeah, yeah, because they didn't have the infrastructure initially many times to have that. Uh, uh, bank uh, POC point of point of contact so okay. po- yeah point of no was it point of contact or point of I don't know I would think point of contact that makes sense. point of contact or point of transaction or something like that okay but basically where you would put the card in or do the transaction yeah so yeah they he said yeah once the smartphone hit they just changed hmm. like, I've had heard similar stories about Af- some African countries mm-hmm. where they didn't have any banks right. or quite big uh, uh, exchange institutions but once the smartphone hit everybody can send their micro payments right, right. and micro and uh, micro transactions yeah China just did the, or uh, India just did this for their entire population it was they registered everyone for the first time in their history so now you can have the you know 600 million people living in poverty there and they can do direct government transfers to help them pay for food and education and things like that people they couldn't reach previously see when the state does it at least for those transactions it mm-hmm. seems so reasonable mm-hmm. even though that would be totally against the capitalistic mentality right yeah, right it's a form of socialism but but he said yeah because the government controls that in china yeah everybody can have it mm-hmm. everybody does use it oh almost everybody right and yeah because i think if you would have that on the private level Mm -hmm. there would be some nasty things going on just to you know split the market to raise the prices Mm -hmm. maybe some cartel in between because i think that's the problem in america now many times right that for instance you have one provider in a one uh, area Mm -hmm. and then what do you do if he wants to raise the prices or whatever you you don't have any competition you don't have any boundaries for them right um yeah so would you say that Asia is more power well impoverished but then again well more well suited to adapt to new technology than America simply because they don't have any uh, rem- well previous previous uh, big corporations who might be interested in establishing their foothold um I think it varies, right? You've got the the Kaibals, if I'm saying that right, in South Korea, the uh, Keiritsus, if I'm saying it right, in Japan, which are the big family-owned businesses, and I think... Yeah, they, it's like they have a specific name, Keiritsus? Yeah, yeah. For family-owned businesses? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, uh, Sony is the classic case, and... Uh, is it really owned by a family? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, a family with uh, multiple generations. You Damn. You can check me on that. But, Damn. Um, and I yeah. thought it was a public company. It is. It is, yeah. Because, um, you know what? Um, I think Cargill was the biggest. Okay. Who was really... Oh, and Mars. Okay. Mars uh, company. Bar, so basically, yeah. yeah, so basically the American food conglomerates mm-hmm. yeah, yeah I, right. I i know they have some just family-owned businesses right. that Wal- are just walmart. ridiculous right is i think walmart isn't anymore right no it's not it's not walmart is public yeah right yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah i think cargill was still totally private okay and mars okay with all those well, i don't know how many out of business brands. by amazon 
Hmm? Now they'll be put out of business by Amazon because they'll deliver your food to your front door. Would you say that Amazon is um, even, even um, if it's even possible for Amazon to compete in, in the long term? Because it seems to me nowadays, all right, America, Amazon. Mm -hmm. But for me, to, mm -hmm. for instance, in Latvia, mm -hmm. European Union, everything, mm -hmm. new economy, mm -hmm. everything. It's quite expensive to actually buy something from Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. Yeah. It that, just shouldn't be like that. I would I think mean, it shouldn't be like that. Yeah, because I get Microsoft Windows easily. Okay. Right? I mean, we have Apple, so Google, taxing Amazon. Uh, Microsoft. Is it, is it expensive for you to use the, the mail? Like yeah, the, the shipping. Most of the time, the shipping the, would be the, the most. Yeah, yeah. But as far as I understand, in America, you yeah. could just like this. Oh, it's very, yeah, it's very cheap. Very and convenient. The, the government, the government uh, so what's up runs with the that? postal service. I would, I would imagine yeah, it's like some combination of the actual cost of postal service and, and maybe some um, anti-competitive laws in the, in, the, in the EU as well to protect the, the, the merchandise stores, the, the brick and mortar stores. I don't know, though. You say you're from St. Louis, but I guess Amazon was in Seattle, right? Um, too bad. Is it too far from you? Can you go there, please? No. Sort it out. <laughs> yeah, I'll go. I'll go make a visit. I'll see if I can. How get far it is there. Seattle? Seattle is Washington, right? Yeah. So Washington is uh, West Coast, something. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What's What's up with actually Washington D.C.? How How come they? Uh, I don't know when they established that territory. I don't either. Yeah, I would guess. Because uh, have you heard uh, of the of the? I don't know if it's even a theory, but the the question was. Why has Washington D.C., the Vatican, mm -hmm. and some other place, I think the city of London, okay. uh, an obelisk. An oblast, you said? An obelisk, oh. the, the, oh, okay. the, the Egyptian <laughs> yeah. uh, pointy tower. Yeah, right? that's so, what they form? Hmm? That's what they form, you mean? No, no. Well, they have the the big, big uh, monument. Oh, okay. As a, as a, as an yeah. obelisk, right? Yeah. I think it's called an obelisk. Let me just check. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like the Washington Monument is, is one of these. But is it Washington Monument? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's yeah. See, is an obelisk. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I think people are. Uh, attributing to to ancient Egypt, ah. right? So what's up with that? Yeah. And how come? So and, and how come? Theories. Yeah, yeah. And how come <laughs> the the dollar bill has the New World Order, right? Yeah. In so, Latin. So the the center of uh, the two centers of Western finance and the center of Western religion. Yeah. But I imagine we could find some other places without with obelisks as well. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But if you would have gone to Peru, you would see you have seen probably Watch some pyramids. I haven't right. been there, but that's on my to-do list. I think Peru had some pyramids, didn't it? Uh, well, they've got Machu Picchu. I assume they also have pyramids. Mexico definitely does. Tenochtitlan. Yeah. Funny enough, I thought that Latin America is somehow uh, different in many respects. Then turns out, not really. Probably Argentina is just Spanish-speaking Italians. Mm. And uh, I think Chileans were sort of a mix of italian spanish and germans okay right so it's it's like all oh, oh just the europeans again all over yeah except right? you've, you've got a big native force that's that's still there because unlike in north america the native and they, americans survive colonialism and the chileans Montreal. have a specific word for those who mix with uh, mestizos right i don't know but yeah they have the specific word so i found that funny yeah which is mixed i think i think that's most of latin america has that word well, well, yeah, it could be, it could be, but it's just funny that so it's it comes so natural to distinguish between pure, right, right. pure native uh, Latin Americans and then right. Well, and then the, then so they got uh, natives, they've got black because they got the big slave colonies that existed then, and then they've got European white. Yeah, and then I don't know about all of those places, but in, uh, I think the vast majority, it's still the European caucasians that tend to rule the economy and the politics cuba being a prominent example fidel castro and the castro brothers were both of uh European oh, yeah side. i guess so yeah, yeah yeah well you know what i don't know how you will feel about it but it's just, to me it seems well at least not i'm not that much affected by it mm -hmm. but it's definitely um it would be definitely better if everybody would have the opportunity uh equally mm -hmm. right but then again yeah 
Well, when you don't, you have populist movements, right? That's what that's what we've had happen across Latin America. But it seems to me that in the 21st century, with the information technology as it is, it's not even possible anymore. How so? What's what's not possible? Uh, to have a just a pure populist movement in mm-hmm. the sense that if you're full of it, people will know. Yeah, you might you might like the Abraham Lincoln's uh, uh, saying, right? Mm-hmm. You can fool some of the people some of the time. Yeah, but you can't fool some all of the, the people all the time. Yeah, uh, and so. Yeah. I would guess that even even if you are quite out of the realm of possibility, yeah. if you really don't deliver on anything, yeah. you'll get stumped. Yeah. There's no I, I, I would have waiting agreed around. more heartily two years ago, but we do have Trump in power. And it changed the whole perspective of what's possible. Yeah, for the worse, yeah. We're, I don't we're, know for the worst, we're man. I'm the, telling you. I'm telling we're in you. The alternative world right now, where what what you say doesn't have to be true. Every, or false. Yeah, everything everything's possible. Yeah, that's that's truly <laughs> a, a statement to be reckoned with. Yeah, everything's possible. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's sort of I would say it's empowering. The future is wider for it's a potential negative world and it's a potential better world. Perhaps that doors have been opened either way. Yeah, I guess that was a quite a. Nice closing statement. Okay. Because we had, uh, yeah, it's almost been two hours. Wow. Okay. Yeah, time flies. Yeah. Time flies. When you're All right. Fun. If you um, if you come around sometime in the future to mm-hmm. Latvia, let mm-hmm. me know. I, I will. Would, I would gladly do another episode with you. All see, right. See how you're doing. Sounds good. Very All nice right. Nice talking man. to you. Thanks.